So with that in mind, let's get to our last two speakers who have been quite patient. I know we're running behind. Um, and these are two uh, incredibly important talks, even though they're coming later in the day. Hopefully everyone's wide awake and ready. The next one is Dr. Becker, who's joining us from uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, where he's part of the Department of Neurology and part of the Transverse Myelitis Center and uh, spends a lot of time working with folks on their rehabilitation plans, goals, and helping them achieve them. And one of the things when we were talking about different uh, talks to give, he's been spending a lot of time looking at the role exercise plays in terms of getting better, in terms of rehabilitation. And uh, this is something that we reinforce to our patients all the time, and I think you've heard it over and over again from Dr. Pardo to Maureen to myself and now Dr. Becker. Staying active is incredibly important in terms of long-term long improvement, uh, not just maintaining function, but getting better. So I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Becker. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a background why we think that activity is, is important. And uh, so to go back to Dr. Barnes' um, discussion yesterday, I don't know if anybody still remembers, we had all the discussions now about what is transosmolitis, what is anomalitis optica, what is ADEM, and uh, which, now I'm trying to tell you actually what we can do about these things to actually get them better and what we think makes them better. So this is a pretty difficult task to give you one explanation why we want to do uh, exercise uh, for three, what sounds like very different diseases. And so we have to try to figure out what do these three things have in common? So ADEM, uh, TM, uh, NMO, what they share is that most of the disability originates from a dysfunction of the spinal cord. So the paralysis, the weakness, um, with the secondary complication of spasticity and neurogenic bowel, neurogenic bladder, um, sexual dysfunction, um, it's based on problems generally with, with the spinal cord, or as Dr. Barnes used to say uh, when he compared it to the stick part of the nervous system. So what happens in the spinal cord from either ADEM or NMO or, or TM is that you have a lesion. So a lesion that's caused by inflammation, and this is kind of depicted here as the little gray zone in the, in the, in the center of the picture right there. And uh, in that lesion site, you have, when, when, it, when it occurs, there's a very strong inflammatory response. So you have this big uh, collection of, of immune cells that are sitting here kind of the, that are gobbling up tissue that has been destroyed. At the same time, you see a formation of a pretty thick uh, scarring later, later, later on, uh, you see the, this green thick tissue that kind of forms more on the outside of this, of this center. If you look at the long blue wires in here, these are kind of, it's a very simple sketch. These are kind of the neurons. These are the wires from the neurons that originate in your brain and then basically conduct the sickness all the way down the spinal cord. And they all, in order to do that, they have to be uh, insulated. And as you most of you are probably pretty aware of, the cells that insulate are these little yellow guys here that stretch out their arms, they're making myelin. And in order for these few thousand wires that come from the brain to actually conduct all the way down the spinal cord, and when they're packed together, the, that insulation needs to be tight and needs to be working well. So what happens uh, in these injuries as well, that these little oligodendrocytes, the little yellow guys here, they, they start degenerating. So what essentially happens, they, they lose their ability to myelinate, and you end up with uh, pretty bare wires. And once these bare wires are uh, laying there, they can't conduct. So if you imagine that the wire starts in your brain and ends up on the bottom part of your spinal cord, if just a tiny little bit of the insulation is missing, the whole wire does not conduct. The, sometimes, so the nervous system can regenerate a little bit, and spontaneously, so it tries to repair some of this of this myelin, and uh, sometimes the repair process is not complete either. So just having myelin in, the, in its place doesn't mean anything unless it's actually functional. And then the third thing that generally happens then later down the road is that some of these long tracts, when they have been injured, um, the, the corresponding neurons are dying. So 
then we always used to think that you have a spinal cord injury from an inflammation or a traumatic spinal cord injury, and you always, we always thought that the only part that's affected is the, is the area of the injury. And this is a picture of a, of a spinal cord where the injury, so this is kind of a cross-section of a cervical spinal cord, and then you go down to the thoracic, the upper thoracic, the middle thoracic, the lower thoracic, and then you go into the lumbar spinal cord. Kind of imagine it's all on top of each other. They just didn't fit all on, on, on one slide. And the injury was placed between here, between T7 and T11. So any kind of, anything that you see white on these, on these pictures are basically inflammatory cells. So you can see changes in the spinal cord, and this is, this is weeks after the spinal cord injury, that go all the way up towards, towards the highest part of the spinal cord. You see all this white stuff on, on the outside here. You see the white parts in here. And then also below in the spinal cord. So a spinal cord injury it does not only affect the area where it happens, but it actually affects the whole spinal cord. So, and as I already tried to point out, our nervous system has a capacity of spontaneously regenerating. So while we are stand, while we're sitting here and while I'm standing here, we we all generate a lot of cells in our nervous system. So we make lots of oligodendrocytes, lots of astrocytes that are that are basically just important for uh, the pure maintenance of our system of our spinal cords and brain. And so the the main cells that we talk about when you talk about regeneration in the, in the spinal cord are, uh, and I don't think. I'm not sure if everybody has been in the, in, the basic, in the basic science session, but to just to point it out, there are uh, oligodendrocytes. These are the, the guys that, that are myelinating, kind of providing insulation of the cells. We have neurons. These are the cells that are kind of creating the wires, to connecting the brain and the muscles. And then you have astrocytes that can look like this, uh, that kind of provide, provide a big support structure for, for the system. Um, in the other very important concept that we need to know for, uh, for this is that we theoretically have all the tools that are needed for repair of the nervous system right there. So there's a set of, of endogenous stem cells that are basically spread out throughout the spinal cord that can theoretically give rise to any kind of neural tissue. And uh, we, we took a couple of pictures of those, and this is how they look like in, in real life, just much smaller. <laughs> Um, so this is a cell that's called a, uh, what's called a tripotential progenitor cell. This is a cell that's essentially a little bit a step away from a stem cell that still can make a neuron, an oligodendrocyte, and an astrocyte. And as these cells kind of start differentiating, they lose that ability. So now this one is more specialized. It's now only a bipotential progenitor, which can only become an astrocyte that myelinates, or an, uh, sorry, an oligodendrocyte that myelinates, or an astrocyte. And then as they then further differentiate, you see some of them just become astrocytes, and you see some of them that become oligodendrocytes. And that's happening spontaneously all the time in, in, in our brain and spinal cord. So, and this has not only been shown in animals, this has been shown very well in, 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 in humans as well. So we know that, oops, that, uh, that uh, basically the glial cells are born, as I just showed. We know that uh, neurons are born in the hippocampus and inflectory bulb in the brain. We have to date not been able to show any newborn neurons in the spinal cord, uh, neither in the animal uh, nor in, uh, in, in humans. Um, we know that the axons, the long wires that I showed that stretch out, can, can regenerate, so you can cut them, and they can kind of sprout out new. And, uh, and as I pointed out, we know that there are stem cells sitting in the cord. So the question is that many people like to ask, so where are these stem cells? And uh, this is kind of a very broad view of a spinal cord. If you see this over here, um, the, the gray stuff in here, or the, the bright white stuff is called the gray matter. This is where most of the cells, the, the nerve cells are sitting at that level. And then you see the outside part that's more darker in here, that's called the white matter. It's kind of the opposite in this picture. <laughs> um, and you see the stem cells are born every day where there's an arrow. And you see, the, the, as a, the, the main message on this picture is basically that they're born throughout the spinal cord. And if you take a very close up picture, you kind of see how they look like. So, let's go to this. So if you just look at, at spontaneous regeneration after spinal cord injury from an inflammatory response or from a traumatic response, 
uh, we know that the spontaneous spot is very limited, and we are trying to understand why this is. And so if you look, oh, I'm sorry, the one more concept to introduce before we go further. Um, the next big question always is how much of, of a repair do we have to do in order to get function? So number one, as we have learned uh, earlier, is that MRI pictures are all very good and we use them a lot to, uh, to identify where lesions are and how they look like, but they do not give us any prediction of your function, at least the current MRI pictures that we have. There are new MRI techniques out there that we're trying to actually uh, quantify, we're trying to see active connections, but that's still in, 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 in a research phase. Um, but here you can see, this is for example, this is a patient that has a fairly extensive lesion in that spinal cord. The spinal cord is the gray structure that goes through here, which should be all very nicely homogeneous, hom homogeneous gray, but then you see this white part in here, which is a, which is a lesion from an inflammation, and uh, you see it almost takes up the whole cord. And you would think if you look at this MRI, well, this person's probably not gonna walk. But this one, this person is walking very well and actually competing in, in, in sports events. So, and then I have seen patients with similar lesions in there who don't have much function at all and are actually almost on a ventilator because it's very high in the spinal cord. So the concept of activity-based restorative therapies, which, which we like to refer to as ABRT, it's basically based on these principles I just lined out. So we, we know that in, when we all are, well, before we're even born, when our nervous system develops, in order to efficiently do that, uh, it needs to be active. And there are very good experiments that have shown that if you, if you deprive the nervous system during its development of activity, it will not develop right. So, and the same thing uh, we, we, we believe um, is important in, in nervous system repair. After the spinal cord injury, what happens? You, you have your spinal cord and you disrupt in, any input that comes from the brain through the spinal cord to the lower part of it because there's a lesion. And so activity can't, no, activity can't quite go through, the, through that lesion. So you have a lower part of the spinal cord that doesn't get enough input. And we have a picture on that. If you don't mind, we me just Xing it out here. All right, thank you. Um, so this is a little cartoon that we, that we made. And uh, do you mind clicking on play? So this is the spinal cord lesion that you have. And if you zoom out and you look at the spinal cord being to your right side, uh, your, where your brain would be on the left side where your, the cord equina or the bottom part of the spinal cord would be, you see that above the level of injury, and the injury is the red part in the middle, activity is pretty much normal because you get all the input in from above, you use your, use your arms, which any kind of muscles put input in, it looks normal. But below that level of lesion, activity is dramatically decreased to levels about uh, 20 or 30% of normal. And uh, do you mind just clicking somewhere in the, in the blue space around it? No. Just outside, yeah. It should come up with the next one. All right. Thank you. Um, so if you look alone in, in terms of what happens to the maintenance of the system, when I told you earlier that we are doing, that we're making hundreds and thousands of, of, of neural cells every day, um, what happens below the level of, level of injury is that with the activity being down by about uh, 70 80 percent, also the pure maintenance of the system is down by about 70 or 80 percent. So the pure cell turnover in these parts of the cord is, is dramatically decreased. So you now have a, have a, uh, a system that has difficulty um, maintaining itself. And now you're asking the system that already has trouble maintaining itself to regenerate which is really, really difficult. And that's why I think it's one of the causes why we see so limited regeneration after spinal cord injuries. And so we believe that if you look at this at the curve, uh, that you would say the more activity you do, the better your, re your regeneration should be, right? So you would think if, you're, if you have a cord injury right here, and you say if you do more activity, you kind of move up on the curve, and maybe at some point you have too much activity, and it may be bad for you. Um, we have looked very closely in, in animals and cells and now in, in humans and 
although we still think that the curve is true, but we have never been able to actually find that peak. So we, don't, we have not figured out that there's any activity that's too much, because it's, it's one of the perception that's uh, prevalent very much in our physical and occupational therapy groups, especially traditionally trained uh, groups that, that feel that in some patients you should not do more activity because you could potentially hurt the nervous system. But we have not been able to demonstrate that anywhere. So what do we use to, to increase activity uh, in the lower part of the spinal cord? So you can't quite use an input from above, right? Because using your arms or just using, trying to activate muscles in the lower part of your body when they're paralyzed, is, it's very difficult. Um, so what you have to do, you have to activate the system from below. And, uh, the system, and what we use for that are FES systems. And FES stands for Functional Electrical Stimulation. And the, the importance is on the word functional, um, because electrical stimulation devices have been out for the longest time. And uh, you can look at this very uh, crudely as looking at like cardiac pacemakers, we had cochlear implants, then in spinal cord injury, we, we got the freehand system, which was an activation of, of an arm with an implantable FES system. You have diaphragmatic pacing for people who have trouble with, with, with breathing. And these were implantable devices. And now, big focus is on the external devices. Um, you have, we have the uh, FES ergometers. They used to be the old one was the Ergus. Uh, you see the one outside that uh, RTI has is the RT300. Um, we have FES bracing, like Bioness. Uh, you have NM, like neuromus neuromuscular electrical stimulation units, like the MP unit, intellect units, and, and so on. And, you, and probably most of you have seen, well, should have seen some of them doing your uh, rehabilitation. So to put this all back together again, so you said we, we, we know that we need optimal levels of, uh, of, of neural activity to actually repair the nervous system efficiently. Uh, we know that the activity is decreased dramatically in the cord below the level of injury. And uh, we think we can uh, increase activity in the lower part of the spinal cord. So, and Janet Dean, who spoke earlier, kind of lined out a couple, in the neurospasticity talk, lined out a couple things that we do, what, what, what we consider FES uh, therapy. So that we, con we uh, distinguish between patterned and non-patterned activity. So patterned activities, which are really more like a functional uh, use of electrical stimulation, where there's bicycling, we have walk si walking systems, we have uh, grasp systems, which Bioness, for example, has one of those. We do, uh, uh, there's partial weight supported walking systems, like the treadmill systems, the robotic systems, and some of them you may have seen in some of your rehabilitation institutes that you have been to in the past. Um, you can use uh, motorized or powered bicycles. Um, and then there, there, there's several other devices for that. And non-pattern activity is also part of ABRT, uh, although not, the, not in the forefront, it's, which basically consists of traditional strengthening, um, a balance training, endurance training. Um, some of, you can use electrical stimulation to just strengthen the muscle. You can use biofeedback devices like uh, Neuromove uh, for um, bowel and bladder uh, issues. And then uh, aquatic therapy is a very big part of, of an activity-based therapy program. So the FES bicycle, if you've seen it outside, uh, kind of is one of the most efficient ways that we believe of delivering electrical stimulation. And how it works is very simple. You have electrodes hooked up to the, to the quadriceps muscles uh, you, that kind of they're straighten, that they're, they're straightening the knee. You have uh, electrodes hooked up to the hamstring muscles that kind of bend the knees, and you have electrodes hooked up to the quads, uh, I'm sorry, to the, to the gluteal muscles. And so the computer will sequentially activate these muscles in the right order, so you can actually ride that bicycle on your own muscle power, even if you have absolutely no voluntary control to your lower muscle, lower extremity muscles. So, and what happens when you do that, it provides an input of activity in the lower part of your spinal cord, and in there, there's a center, it's called the, the Central Pattern Generator, or CPG, which is kind of the computer for walking. Uh, most people think that you need your brain to walk, but uh, that's not true. You can walk without the brain. And I don't know if anybody ever had uh, grown up on the farm, you see when they slaughter chicken. <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can run and walk until the oxygen goes out, you know? <laughs> 
Um, and so this center is in, in the lower part of the spinal cord. What you need your brain for is, what you need your brain for is to activate the system, kind of to say, start walking, stop walking, go faster, go slower. This is what your brain is for. And so that's why we can understand that you don't have to repair all the connections in the spinal cord to, to, to get these programs activated. So, but we think that by, use, by activating the, 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 the lower extremities in a cycling motion, we can activate the central pattern generator in the lumbar spinal cord. There is a, uh, a central pattern generator also in higher parts of the spinal cord, for example, in the cervical cord, and these things actually in, uh, interact. They kind of try to communicate with each other. So by activating the lumbar spinal cord, we're not only activating the levels at where the input comes in, but because these centers try to talk to each other, you kind of activate systems at, uh, far above and below these levels. So the, the insurance companies don't really like to pay us for um, the benefits to which I lined out as uh, level two benefits, which, I, which as Janet Dean pointed out earlier, it's a decreased spasticity and possibly enhanced regeneration of function. Um, the insurance companies kind of see the primary benefits, which are mostly medical, which shows that when you train the muscle with FES, you know that you increase the muscle mass, you increase strength. Um, by, by doing that, uh, you kind of put tension on the bones, you decrease, uh, I'm sorry, you, you increase bone density, and you decrease the risk of fractures. You get basically a full cardiovascular workout, which you were unable to do in, uh, if, if you weren't doing that. And the, but the, the workout is still not, it's still far from, from optimal. If you cycle the bike on, at 50 RPMs per minute for an hour, you make about 3,000 steps, the equivalent, which if any, I think most of you have ever worn, sometimes worn one of these pedometers, and you can count how many uh, steps you actually take every day, uh, which is far beyond that. So we're trying to get close to these levels of activity, but even with a lot of uh, um, um, rehabilitation, we've still probably not been able to reach the optimal levels, which is probably the reason why we have never seen the peak of the activity curve. <laughs> um, the other thing that we see, you see, uh, so decreased com complications like bone fractures, you have decreased skin breakdown because you build up the muscle, which kind of puts padding underneath the skin um, and decreases the risk of, of ulcers. You, uh, there's decreased blood clots, and I talked about the, the reasons why we like to use it a lot, because we think we can actually uh, induce changes in, 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 in spinal cord injuries that uh, is not known, has not been known before. So, but can we say that these things, when we see the improvements in function, is this really regeneration? And this is a very difficult question to answer. So we're trying, we're trying to take the best shot at that, and since we can't do this in, in humans, we can't give them ABRT, and then we look at their spinal cord afterwards. There, we don't find many volunteers for those studies. Uh, <laughs> we have to do this in the, in, in, in the animals. So what we do, uh, we, we took this to a rat. It looks like a mouse, but I think it is a rat. So what, 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 what we do, we kind of we build an, an implantable FES system where we kind of use, you put underneath their skin a stimulator and the wires are going down to the leg muscles and uh, on, on both sides, so on the, on the left side and, and on the right side. And then we stimulate them. Um, and there's always the question, how often should we stimulate them? So in our clinic, we generally say you need a, an, an activation paradigm of about at least three, three to five times a week for, for an hour each. So we did this with the animals, and then what happens is this, and I'm not gonna bore you with the big, heavy slides, I'm just gonna tell you what it shows. Um, so if you, if you look at the spinal cord, um, this is the cervical spinal cord and this is the lumbar spinal cord. And the bars up here, this is the number of cells that are born in the spinal cord. And uh, if you just try to forget to look at any of the, forget the, forget the yellow bars, you know that the injury level is, is here. You see that there are more and more cells born towards the injury and then much less cells born below the level of injury. And um, if you apply FES, what happens in the lumbar spinal cord, these, these parts of the cord, and you see these two bars here, you see how cell birth rises. And so what does it mean for you? So when we looked at this very closely, we were saying what are these cells that are, that are growing in the spinal cord down there? And uh, 
there are a lot of uh, markers that we can use in immunochemistry, and these are basically cells that, are, that the progenitor cells that I pointed out earlier in the talk, that are the cells that can give rise to uh, the neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes, but more so with these cells that only give rise to uh, astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And, uh, yeah. and so basically what we think what happens with FES is that you can stimulate your own endogenous stem cells to proliferate and potentially re, uh, repair the, the injury and help you restore some of the function. And knowing that most of these cells are becoming uh, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, it kind of gives us a hint that possibly these cells are actually remyelinating some of the wires that have lost the insulation in a functional way. Because by, by just repairing a couple connections, you can make, get a disproportionate return of function. So the, the baseline summary is here. When, whenever you have a cord injury, for, and it doesn't matter, is it NMO, TM, uh, ADEM, there is decreased activity in the lower part of the spinal cord, which makes it difficult for the system to repair. And so the most efficient way that we think in, in, in activating the the lower part of the spinal cord, um, consistent of, of, of FES, uh, will result in an improved outcome, so an, an improvement of function. So meaning be active as early as possible, uh, do as much rehabilitation as you can, and uh, as Maureen said earlier, you will, you will only get out of rehabilitation what you put into it. So it takes a commitment. So this is not, so when we, when we see people at, uh, at, at our center, um, you don't come just to us and we say, okay, we're gonna give you therapy for two weeks at a time and then we send you home and say, you did a great job and uh, call us if you have problems. So how this, is, how this works is, this is a process that, that continues throughout life. There is no, uh, no time, when, no time interval that you say, okay, we have not recovered by six months or 12 months or two years, that this is the level where you're at. And that's not true. So none of these time intervals actually apply. So what you have to do with activity should be kind of like a pill that you take. So you build basically an activity-based program into your life. And that's what, what we're trying to help you with. You come to us, we build an ABIT program, you build it into your life, and then we see you depending on how far away you are, uh, and, and how young you are, like the, in, in children we see them very frequently throughout the year, three to six times, or three to four times a year, when adults who live far away, we can do this once or twice a year, uh, given that they have a good home support to follow a, an ABRT program. So I think with that I'm gonna open up to questions. Uh, so, so have there been any any uh, any comparisons between the FES bike and other forms of of basic ABRT? And so, the rehabilitation literature is very sparse, and you will find a lot of case reports and sh short case studies. But the head-to-head -head trials between the FES bike and other uh, modalities are, are not I have not I have not seen them. We're trying right now to we have two trials going. We're trying to figure out what is the optimal dose of FES in humans. So we're trying to figure out, and if, if any of you, I guess, are interested in that, just give me, send me an email or, or contact me later on. Because um, right now we, we're recommending generally to give FES three times a week, uh, three to five times a week, and see how it goes. But we need to figure out, is it better to do do it once a week, three times a week, five times a week, or seven times a week. We know from experience that our patients who do more do better. So I think the answer is probably the more the better, but we, we're on the, on the path right now of scientifically proving that.
And this is a very difficult problem because, I mean, you will find uh, rehabilitation centers all across the country, including in our local surroundings, where it's kind of similar therapy is, is practiced. So what you may want to recommend to your mom, I don't know if you're in, in this area, but I, th I, but I know Dr. Greenberg has access to uh, a few groups here who work with them closely, has been trying to change the rehabilitation uh, programs here a little bit, and, and if not, I mean, we would always be happy. You can, they can come down for one-time consultations. We can, we can, we can look at her and, and kind of point her in the right direction. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. After an acute onset, um, there's no evidence to support that it, you know, is, is detrimental. But sort of, I know with my wife, uh, you know, when she has sort of pushed herself, she seems to pay the price for it, you know, in the, in the immediate short term afterwards. Now, I, I'm not saying that it, you know, it, it would trigger another acute episode, but is there, I mean, do you hear of anecdotal evidence of doing too much uh, has a short-term, you know, sort of a backsliding uh, effect. So, so we can we can see this very very frequently, and actually mostly in the uh, in the MS population, where you see that once you go with too much activity at once, they you kind of trigger an attack of fatigue that takes some of them days to recover from. So, what we do with 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 these with these patients is that we kind of we judge how much they can do, and once we see the uh, evidence of fatigue will stop there. And so what you can do, you can basically do more um, periods of shorter, so shorter, um, shorter periods, but more frequently, and uh, tailored to what, what, you can, what you can tolerate. So, and, but that's, that's very common. And we think in, in MS, for example, we, we believe that most of this is triggered by an increase in body heat. So if I push you very hard on, on a cardiovascular workout, you, you increase your core temperature, and, and most of our patients are sensitive to, to higher temperatures. So that would be an option you, you, you could try. Um, but overall, we don't think that it hampers uh, restoration of function. The, the biggest uh, danger of, of backing off is if you, so you don't, let's say you, you, you try this activity and you say, well, it, it makes her very fatigued. You say, well, let's do less the next time, or let's do do nothing. Then the muscles will get smaller, they atrophy, um, the cardiovascular properties of her. So any kind of stress that you put on will put even more stress onto her later. So she's much more intolerant for future stress. So I think, in if you kind of keep a constant level of training on her and slowly try to build her up, you will realize that over time she's going to be able to tolerate more. So that's how it go. Well, we're really prejudiced because we spent 10 weeks at Krieger <laughs> this summer, and you're our doctor. But I think what people want to know is if it's a viable thing and if it works. And yes, in Jim's case, it's done wonders. But also maybe ask, I'm sure there's people in the room that have used the FAS bike and have used this. You might ask. Mm -hmm. No? Any, any volunteers? Can I get, well, Cody Unzer, right. I know she has the bike. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. are trying to get the bike and have had a year long struggle with our insurance agency, you know, our insurance company on paying for the bike because they say it's experimental. But I mean, how do you, how do you fight that? What do you do? So this is an extremely difficult battle and we fight it every, every day. So number one, we can, the argument from the insurance company that says it's experimental, this can be turned out very easily because it's not. And there's the paperwork is done, done there from the FE, from the FDA. So we end up, Generally, any expensive piece of equipment that we apply for, it might be the standard, the glider, the FDS bike, even the handheld FDS unit, it's generally declined. So number one trial is generally declined. And so we have a whole round of letters. Are you ready for round number two? So, <laughs> right. right, so then it goes round number two and see, see if we can get it through then. And from there it goes round three, which is usually a peer-to-peer, -peer. Um, and then it always depends on what the indication is. So in our traumatic spinal cord injuries, we have a much higher chance of, 
of meeting their requirements, where in the demyelinating spinal cord injuries, it's much more tricky because there's much sparse data available. So generally what we're trying to do, we, we try to work with the local, with the foundation, see uh, if fundraising works. Um, but in, I mean, there are many instances that despite our maximum effort, uh, we are not successful. But that's also a reason why you should probably go to center, to big centers like us and, uh, and, and, and UT Southwestern um, because they have experience in dealing with them. Because you only have, three sh you only have so many shots at the insurance company. If you, if you waste them with somebody doing a, 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 an appeal for you who is not experienced, you may do yourself a, uh, not, not really a favor. You got the last question. Hi, I'm, I've shown several people here already. I have the Bioness system, mm -hmm. and my insurance company, two actually companies, denied it even on appeal. But I've gone through the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services, and I've been struggling to keep my job as a nurse. And um, they came out and videotaped me trying to do my job without it. Um, they've rented it for me for a month, and they're going to come out in a week or so and film me using it and how much more improved I am getting around in the clinic. Um, and they're going to take that to the medical director in Austin, and they feel that they are will not have any problem purchasing it for me. So um, I encourage everybody, just Google Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services. Each state will have a different um, site or whatever, and they'll even have you put your zip code in because there are several offices within each state. Thank you very much. I think this is a very helpful comment. Thank you.